With the Kesante buffs, Riot obviously went way overboard. Kesante's numbers completely exploded and he became one of the best champions in the entire game, literally overnight. Yes, Riot noticed their mistake relatively quickly and hit Kesante with a minor hotfix nerf, but this nerf was not even close to being enough. The champion remains just as ridiculously overtuned, especially since the doubling of his passive's bonus damage during his ultimate hadn't been touched at all. And it is his ultimate that gives Kesante his very special privileged position among top lane tanks in general. As you know, top lane champions are always memed for being stuck on their island, in their perpetual 1v1 that never seems to stop, while the other four teammates actually have control over the outcome of the match. But Kesante is different. He has full carry potential because he, unlike other tanks, will scale into the late game like very few other champions do, an unstoppable force. Kesante is the perfect champion to play if you want to take matters into your own hands, but before I show you exactly how it's done, let's go over his runes and items first, as usual. Believe it or not, but some people come to my videos just for the build recommendations, so let's not make them wait. The most consistent Kesante rune page you can play is Grasp of the Undying, Demolish, Conditioning and Overgrowth, with Approach Velocity and Biscuit Delivery secondary. Not only is Grasp of the Undying a rune designed to be taken by melee tank champions, but it also fits Kesante's natural trading patterns just perfectly. In lane you're all about those quick bursty trades with Q plus auto attack, and with your extended auto attack range after hitting a spell, Grasp of the Undying is really easy to trigger. Additionally, this rune synergizes with Kesante's general game plan of scaling into the late game, because the max health increase will help you later on as well, not only for trading in lane. It scales with all the stats Kesante cares about, it is easy to proc, and it should be an auto include for you. Now tanks always have this reputation that you can just ignore them, especially when they're split pushing because they can't deal with towers anyway, they just buy defense, but Demolish changes that. Demolish is very important for that very reason, because with this rune you can actually put pressure on the enemy map. Yes, you could take Shield Bash for more combat power and this rune also synergizes with your footwork or with Gargoyle Stoneplate Shield, but depending on the team composition, there are matchups in which you will need to split push rather than fight, and here Demolish is absolutely invaluable. Additionally, getting that plating gold in lane also helps Kesante a lot because, again, he scales very well, especially with items. Now, conditioning is the perfect choice in the next row. Again, the other options are okay in some matchups, but conditioning can be picked every single game if you ask me. It is the best scaling rune on Kesante, and don't forget, the extra armor and magic resist is also converted into more damage when in all-out form. You need to keep your head low during the early game anyway, so the fact this rune does nothing before 12 minutes doesn't really matter to you. You want to be passive early anyway and proactive later on. On a similar note, Overgrowth is again a very well scaling rune for tank champions. You buy a lot of health anyway, which makes use of the rune's percent health increase, and you also see a lot of minions fall, so this is a perfect choice. Now there are different options for the secondary path, but Approach Velocity and Biscuit Delivery are just so strong. Approach Velocity really allows you to force the enemy into the 1v1 with you if you so desire, especially once you get your mythic item, but we get to that in a second. However, even without items, Kesante's kit is just perfectly designed to keep pushing the enemy around, and Approach Velocity makes you stick even harder with a 7.5% or 15% increased movement speed on slowed enemies. Biscuit delivery is just a generally strong choice, well Kesante's mana costs aren't too high, but biscuits still allow you to keep fighting for a longer time because you will spam Q quite a bit. However, the true value of this rune is buffing your early game with its regeneration. Having those three biscuits in lane where you're most vulnerable will go a long way to ensure you actually get to scale. The 10% attack speed chart is preferred over the adaptive force chart because you will weave in a lot of auto attacks with Kesante as you trade, not only to trigger your grasp of the undying, but also to trigger your passive of course. The double armor shards are chosen in AD matchups, but against AP top laners you want double magic resist naturally. Okay, the item build. I mean, itemization on tanks is always a little bit iffy if you want to take a formulaic approach to it, because, well, tank items are designed to counter specific threats on the enemy team, but Kesante's itemization is actually a little more straightforward than that of most other tanks. First of all, you start the early game with the Doran's Shield and with an early Barmy Cinder before getting your upgraded boots, either Steel Caps or Mercury Treads depending on the matchup. This gives you good sustain and Barmy Cinder also helps you with damage in longer fights and trades, but the main selling point is of course controlling the minion wave with Barmy Cinder. Without this, you can struggle with wave clear a little bit. However, your true core build and I don't say this often about tank champions, but I really think you can get this in most games, regardless of the matchup, is Icebone Gauntlet, Sunfire Cape and Gargoyle Stoneplate. 
Yes, Iceborne Gauntlet and Sunfire are pure armor items, which can be a little awkward in AP matchups, but the value of these items is just so high. As I've mentioned, you will spam Q quite a lot during fights, and Iceborne Gauntlet's spellbait effect synergizes with that perfectly. The enemy is permanently slowed, deals decreased damage to you, and you can just do with them whatever you want. This is your most important power spike. Iceborne Gauntlet will make you that much stronger. Now, Sunfire Cape is of course the natural upgrade to Barmy Cinder, but well, as I've said, it is a more armor-focused build, and this can be a little iffy against AP mages. On the other side though, Sunfire Cape's damage is really impactful, especially when you have all that sticking power. Not only with your spells, but also with Iceborne Gauntlet plus Approach Velocity. I mean, even with AP matchups, with double magic resist charge plus Mercury Treads, these two armor items won't really hurt your survivability too much, they still have a lot of health. Now Gargoyle's Stoneplate is just perfect, giving mixed resistances, also aiding in longer fights, but most crucially, the active shield can save your life when you are in your ultimate form. As you know, Kesanta sacrifices a lot of health when he presses R, but Gargoyle's Stoneplate's shield allows you to fight for even longer, while possibly even baiting the enemy into overcommitting. However, it is of course still true, you need to itemize against specific enemy threats, sometimes against AD damage, sometimes against AP damage. You have plenty of armor already of course, but your standard armor items you buy in addition to that when you're against full AD teams or when there's a fat hyper carry like a Tristana or a Jinx on the enemy team are Thorn Mail and Branduin's Omen. Your preferred magic resist items of choice? Force of Nature and Spirit Visage. Okay, now that that's out of the way, let's get right into the analysis. Okay, Santa's lane phase is definitely the weakest part of his entire game. I mean, it makes sense, he needs his items to scale, he is a tank champion but he still has a relatively strong late game as you know, but I mean, even though his early game is quite weak, he does have the tools to make some plays happen. He has efficient trading patterns as you're about to see. Against Scion specifically, in this matchup he has a dash to outplay Scion's Q if he needs to, he also has CC immunity, but I mean Scion's Q has a fairly short cooldown so Kesanta's tools won't always be up when Scion tries to hit him. This creates a very interesting dynamic, but in general in this lane both players just try to farm it up and reach their potential late game. If we have a look at this trading pattern in action by the way, you typically want to get your grasp of the undying ready first, which is quite easy by just attacking the minion wave, and also some enemy top laners will hit you quite frequently because you're a melee champion, but once it's ready, you just want to land a Q, which makes it super easy to land the empowered auto attack due to the slow, and then you get a grasp trigger as well, and the enemy cannot really trade against this too efficiently because the combo is quite quick. I mean, it really depends on the trading pattern on the matchup, but that's the general idea. Here, as we can see, they're trading Qs even, which is fine, Kesanta interrupts Scion just in time before the knockup is ready, and he gets another Q into auto attack, even goes aggressive with a shield here, which, I mean, it's a, it's a play you can make if you feel safe enough. And this is, by the way, this is a point in the lane where he really messes up. The general trading pattern, as you know, just Q and auto attack, here he actually dashes way too aggressively into tower range, which as you can see ultimately costs him his life. But yeah, I mean, if you want to play Cassandra the safe way, you should just keep it simple, you should go for the Q auto attacks and use your dash defensively, both of your dashes actually, it's way safer that way. That small mistake does make Cassandra's lane a little bit more difficult, but it's nothing major, it doesn't change your playing patterns as you can see, you're still going for the Q auto attacks, you can use the dash to get in range for Q auto, uh, or you can save your dash, it really depends on the situation and on the potential threat the enemy brings. But yeah, the more you can stack your grasp, the more you can disrupt the enemy. As you can see, even they're using the CC immunity to outplay Scion's Q, you have the tools, and Scion also has the tools. It's really a skill matchup, you're isolated in the top lane, as you know. It's the true 1v1 lane for a reason. But here's a part of the lane where many K Santa players, especially newer ones, tend to make massive mistakes. I mean, most early game champions really suffer before level 6, but as soon as they reach their level 6 power spike and unlock their ultimate, they have, for example, Vayne. Vayne is a good one. Vayne is a ginormous power spike level 6. And you tend to believe K Santa would be the same way, so once you're level 6, you can just perma all in or 1v1 the enemy top laner. But that's not the case. K Santa's ultimate is important, yes but you also need your items still. You shouldn't go too aggressive even though you got your ultimate now. And this is what this Cassandra player is doing phenomenally, by the way. He's playing it very patiently, doesn't change his game plan whatsoever, still tries to stack grasp and to trade efficiently, and doesn't just go blindly all in with his ult. You need your items first and foremost. Of course, you still can go for plays if opportunities present themselves. Here, for example, it looks like Cassandra can push Scion all the way into his tower, so first pushes him out of the bush and then ults him to for even more distance, but Scion's not, not quite in tower range, so that trade isn't... I mean, it's still good, because Cassandra's ultimate gives you a lot of combat 1v1 power, 
But against Sion, I mean, Sion is very safe himself once he has his ultimate because he can always use it defensively, which is exactly what end up, ends up happening here. I mean, as you can see, Kaysante deals so much damage, chases Sion down with all the mobility, but Sion here is all the time in the world. Kaysante deals damage very consistently, doesn't have huge bursts, executes or whatever. So he's always safe. However, plays like these are what you can go for if you really feel like it. However, I strongly advise against this still if you're playing against early game lane bullies like Darius or whatever. Whenever there's a champion on the enemy team that can burst you down very quickly, this is super risky. In any case, there are situations in which your ultimate is always valuable regardless of the matchup, and this is when the enemy tries to gank you, because your ult effectively puts the enemy on a timer as you're about to see. Just a quick side note, here we have a beautiful example of what I meant earlier, Kaysante using his mobility to dodge Sion's charged Q. This is the dynamic I was alluding to, if you use it well, Sion can't really touch you. However, the point of this situation is, normally ganking a tank top laner is kind of free, you can outkite him and beat him with numbers advantage, Kaysante however with his ultimate, well you deal so much more damage all of a sudden, yes you die faster too, but all those damage, the, the buffs you get in your ult form, you can definitely trade 1v1 in most cases, as is the case here. I mean, Kesanta will go down eventually too, as you saw, but getting a 1 for 1 trade when the enemy jungler had to use their time to actually get you is always valuable for your team. But while all of this is so far so good, this Kesanta definitely suffers from what I like to call top lane syndrome. You're isolated on your island there, and mid lane tower falls, and bot lane tower as well, as you can see, but there is nothing a top laner can do here. You are still stuck on your island and there's nothing you can do to prevent your team from slowly but surely losing the map. However, as you will see, Kaysante is a little different, because Kaysante has the late game carry potential unlike most other top lane tanks. And the late game is definitely something Kaysante can look forward to. As mentioned, the first item power spike, or your item power spikes in general on this champion, are just massive, and here just with his mythic he can trade so efficiently against Sion, there's essentially no way Sion can kill him anymore or can put any kind of pressure on him. Kaysante can outkite him easily, freely stack his grasp, and freely farm his wave. In fact, Kaysante has complete lane control at this point, despite the fact that Sion scales quite well himself. Sion is the one who needs to be careful not to overextend, as Kaysante can punish him very heavily for every single mistake, while also pushing the wave non-stop, being unpunishable by also enemy jungle ganks. And quite frankly, when it is your teammate who comes to your aid, the enemy Sion is just dead on the spot. Kaysante is just super oppressive here, the slow is incredible, the follow-up from Ezreal's damage is super free because the enemy is just pushed around and locked down, and as you can see, they also make an easy escape here, just a good value play in the top lane overall. Oh, and at this stage of the game, entering the mid and late game, Kaysante is also a phenomenal split pusher who can 1v1 the enemy top laner when he needs to. When I said Sion is the one who needs to be careful now, I really meant it. This 1v1 was not even remotely close, and due to the CC from your general kit and from your mythic item, if Sion doesn't have his ultimate here, he's just dead and there's nothing he can do. However, the impact of lane difference in mid and bot lane really starts to show. They lose another mid lane tower right here, and shortly after, blue team even has to say goodbye to their bot lane inhibitor. This is really a tough situation for them, but we'll see what Kaysanta has to say about this. Oh, and the reason he wasn't defending in that situation, uh, I guess mistakes happen and, um, well, better luck next time? In any case, this is the late game and you are Kaysanta. It's the strongest point of the match for you and all it takes is one opening.
If the enemy carry is foolish enough to be in your ult range, or in this case even in melee range, anyway, you pull the trigger on your R immediately and one shot them with your buffed damage. From there it is an easy cleanup with your mobility and your DPS, because the enemy falls so quickly, especially with your defensive items, your low health doesn't even matter all that much. But I must say I think it's kinda ironic how the top laners, the two who are stuck on the island in the early game, are the ones who are carrying the teamfight for their respective teams in this situation. Okay, Santa's team does come out on top here, and this is quite crucial for the turnaround of the game, and we of course have to take a moment to appreciate how much of a bro this master he is, just standing aside giving Kaysanta that well-deserved pentakill. The last example was of course kind of weird, because both teams ended up getting caught by the um, respective other team's enemy top laner, which led to very chaotic dynamics, however in most cases, such as in this one, it's more likely that you're just in the middle of the fight and keep disrupting the enemy with your hard CC spells, which have very short cooldown by the way, while still tanking absolutely everything and pressing R when the situation is right. Team fighting with Kaysanta really is just as easy, since it is very straightforward for your teammates what they have to do. You got nothing to worry about because you're so incredibly tanky, and whenever you attack someone with your crowd control, your allies can follow up very easily. If you want even more information on Kaysanta and how to play him, then click the link on your screen right there.